Buenas noches. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alberto Hernandez. I'm the chief librarian archivist for the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Um, twisted, but I don't want to pull the microphone. You know. um, on behalf of Centro, uh, and I welcome our distinguished panelists and uh, Ed Vegas family members and all of you to one event. It's called the Legacy Series, and we're trying to uh, uh, bring public attention to the uh, Ed Vega Junque's uh, literary work. Uh, we are very proud that one of our collections is, is Ed Vega's uh, family papers, and we're very proud of that collection. It's among our, our treasured archeo archival materials. Um, I just want to send an open invitation to everybody to come to the central events, and of course, to come to the library when you need information about Puerto Ricans and other uh, ethnic uh, uh, Latinos in the USA. Uh, I don't want to delay you anymore. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Maritza Stankic. I'm a professor, an associate professor at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. Can you hear? A little, a little higher? A little higher. Okay, I'll get closer. Better? Better? Mejor. Okay. That's pretty close. Yeah, that's pretty close. Okay, better? Maybe it's better. Okay. Ahí? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I teach uh, Edgardo Vega Junque's uh, work at the University of Puerto Rico, and we've um, put together, you know, the center has put together here an interesting panel of people who can speak about him both personally and professionally and engage his work. Uh, I'd like to introduce everybody up here uh, formally. Uh, I think we're very blessed to have with us uh, Edgardo Vega Junque's oldest daughter, uh, Allison, only, uh, oldest, daughter. Old, only daughter, oldest <laughs> child, Allison Vega. Um, uh, an educator currently teaching math at, Co at the Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School, author of an engaging blog called Ali's Angioma is Now a Miss. There's some uh, actually really nice posts there about, about her father. And, um, and has raised Ed's only grandchild, Saki. Um, am I pronouncing her name? Sanchi. Sanchi. Uh, we have with us uh, to my right, um, Professor Pedro Lopez Adorno, a uh, professor with the Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Latino Studies at Hunter College, where he has been teaching since 1987. His areas of expertise are Latin American poetry, contemporary Caribbean literature in Spanish, Puerto Rican literature from colonial times to the present, Latino literature in the United States, and related literary criticism and theory. He's also a poet, with his work included in a, a number of anthologies, and the author of 13 books and numerous articles, the most recent of which are Opera Ardiente, Arte de Cenizas, and La Ciudad Prestada. Uh, he also founded and directed uh, Tercer Milenio, an, an annual review of Latin American contemporary literature uh, through, uh, through the 90s. Um, to my left um, uh, is a long-standing uh, close friend of Edgardo Vega's. Um, uh, both, she's a partner of Dan Evans, a uh, writer and author, I should say, or wife, depending on how you, you know, how what you prefer, uh, of, um, of author uh, Dan Evans, uh, author of, uh, among other works, uh, Dialogues from the Ascent, and uh, her name is Lo Lois Pascal Evans. She's a performance artist no known better as Lulo, Lulu Lolo. Lulu Lolo. Yeah. Uh, Lulu Lolo. Uh, they uh, both have been, were very good friends um, with Ed Vega and his uh, ex-wife Pat for over 40 years. Uh, in fact, uh, Ed Vega dedicated uh, his collection of short stories, Mendoza's Dreams, to Mr. Evans. And they also, he and Mr. Evans also, mm, I think I lost the mic. Uh, also worked together during, during, uh, as community organizers in the 60s in, uh, in El Barrio, East Harlem, for an organization called Block Development Project. Uh, so I think it's interesting to have somebody with that kind of uh, uh, historical depth um, here. And uh, 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 further to my left, um, Professor Richard Perez is an assistant professor of English at John Jay College. Uh, he earned his PhD at CUNY Graduate Center, uh, and his disciplinary interests are U.S. Latino, uh, a, and ethnic literatures, trans-American and Caribbean literatures, and post-colonial literature and theory. His publications include an edited anthology entitled Contemporary U.S. Latina O Literary Criticism out on Palgrave. And is, he's currently working on two book projects, the first an analysis of U.S. Latina O aesthetics, and the second a reconsideration of the specter 
in trans-American literature, which is actually something I hope to talk to him about. Um, he also published an excellent interview uh, with Edgardo Vega Junque in the Central Journal in the spring 2006 issue, which I, which I wanted to mention since uh, I'll consider it, consider it one of the authoritative interviews. So I wanted to thank everybody, and I, I think we could we could make this dynamic and take turns speaking and maybe converse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't know if anything. Uh, did you? Did we have somebody who who's in a in particular order? Or? No order. Did you want okay. to begin? Or? I did not want to begin. I, okay. I'll, I'll begin. <laughs> That's good. I'll begin. Thanks. Um, part of what I want to do today is just read a, a series of uh, reflections. Um, that deal more or less with his later work, uh, and in, in particular, The Lamentable Journey, which uh, I would argue, he wouldn't, but I would argue, uh, <laughs> is his best work. Um, so often, Ed and I talked about this kind of, the, the, task, the task of reading, uh, and how reading infected or affected or directed the future. Um, so let me just begin. First, I want to thank Mario Ramirez and the Centro for Puerto Rican Studies for their gracious invitation and their extraordinary commitment to the life of the mind, to Puerto Rican culture, and in a larger sense, to what it means to be Latino in the United States. And we know that, for, that what it means to be Puerto Rican and Latino today is different now than it was in those brutal beginnings in those early days of immigration, where predominantly, where a predominantly white nation met us with enormous resistance at best, too often with outright violence and discrimination. Yet as the Centro understands and the work of Vega Yunque fictionally posits, the future of the United States and the Americas is a Latino future. Mm -hmm. Or as comedian George Lopez puts it, uh, asking rhetorically, as if he's letting out some kind of secret. Who do you think is running this country? Guess. Like George Lopez, the trajectory of Vega Yunque's work seems to change in response to growing Latino power. It is as if Vega Yunque understood in the latter part of his career the secret that Lopez was talking about, that there was a fundamental shift at, the, at work in the United States, cultural, historic, aesthetic, and at the heart of this national alteration, its catalysts were Latinos. It's interesting when you think of his titles, uh, early work, uh, as I put it, they're, they're kind of two phases of, of Ed Vega's work. The early work is The Comeback, 1985, Mendoza's Dreams, 1987, uh, Casualty Report, 1991, and what you get are kind of very concise titles. Uh, as if Vega, as if, as if Ed himself is working out what it means to be a writer. And then later, 12, 13 years later, there's this kind of hiatus, this break between novels, and the titles completely change. Mm. Uh, kind of fluid, musical, uh, daringness and courage to the titles, an epic thrust and quality, right? Um, as if he had realized that something, maybe this Latino future that I want to talk about, was something that he had to document and chronicle. Uh, 2003, no matter how much you promised to cook or pay the rent, you blew it because Bill Bailey ain't never coming home again, a symphonic novel. 2004, the, the lamentable journey of Omaha Bigelow into the impenetrable, impenetrable uh, Loisaida jungle, you see. Um, how does a novel become a song? And what does the song ask of us, right? What does reading ask of us? Uh, the promise of democracy and justice here, in its deepest sense, is reliant. Vega, Yunque, Vega Yunque's work insists on the undeniable presence, on the creative impact, on the political import of its Latino population. It's interesting, of course, that o Obama is impossible without the Latino vote which he understood um, as he brings Soto Sotomayor as his first huge dramatic gesture uh, and puts her on the Supreme Court, right? That is to say, a kind of wink, a kind of understanding 
uh, that the Latino vote has uh, made the difference, if you will. For Latinos do not only embody cultural difference, not white or black in the US sense, Spanish speaking, etc., but in their difference make certain ethical demands regarding the constitution of citizenship and our fundamental responsibility to the other. In Vega Yunque's work, hospitality is the central ethical injunction. And this notion of hospitality, how we welcome the other, how we care for the other, how we depend on the other, is virtually impossible without the act of reading. I'm reminded of Emmanuel Levinas's description of inspiration, which Ed and I often talked about, uh, where he argues inspiration in is when one is touched on the inside by the other and drawn out beyond ourselves. Learning, growing, living is impossible without the touch, without the traumatic encounter with the other. Life is activated in that moment of hospitality. The other, as Levinas puts it, breathes life into us. And if you think about it, even the most primal sense, my brother just had a daughter, uh, so I'm thinking about babies. Uh, even in the most primal sense, if a, uh, doctors often say that if a child isn't touched and carried, that they can die, which is kind of extraordinary, right? Uh, the kind of the, the work that touching does, right? The work that the, the touch of the other does for us. Um, this, according to Vega Yunque, is what fiction does. In this sense, the Latino future, which is also the future of the U.S., there is no future, there is no U.S. future without Latinos, is inexorably linked to our relationship to literacy and to a literature that inspires. The future Latino, the Latino that will survive and thrive and transform the Americas, is the one who reads. Latinos are haunted by the future. This is, in his late work, Vega Yunque's warning to us. To quote Edward Glissant, the great Caribbean philosopher, I write for a reader in the future. What he means in the future, what he means is the future belongs to the reader. Of course, he's complaining too, right? Uh, Glissant is, is also not just a philosopher, but also a, a poet an and, and an author. And, and he, he often complains that no one reads him. Uh, but this is a kind of the predicament of fiction writing, right? And, and Ed Vega himself constantly talked about this. Who will read me and when? Um, this is if I, if I get it any close, there you go. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, this is what is at stake in Ed Vega's work. This is the responsibility Vega, Vega Junque's fiction imposes on us. There is something apocalyptic here, something that, uh, something that literature uh, links to, to, to survival itself. At the end of the lamentable journey, he states, perhaps the mass of tragedy and comedy are one. And no matter how much fun this has been, it is, it is time to address the novel. Not solely as entertainment, as the merchants would have us believe, but as something much more intrinsic to the health of a culture, as an examination of life in all its myriad manifestations. Close quote. Vega Junque pushes against the merchant's need to sell a depoliticized entertainment and suggests that literature is intrinsic to the health of humanity. Juno Diaz in The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde says violence is the end of language. At the moment language fails, violence takes its place, fills in for it as a structuring impulse. If stories cannot hold the shape or the contours of our reality, if they cannot protect us and impel us into the future, then violence must. This, Ed Vega understood, was the tension at the heart of this country and of this hemisphere and of this time. The symbolic battle between guns and books, between investment in the military and education, between a lynching or, or a drive-by and a poem, a drive-by shooting, by the way, is, is an interesting example of what happens when expression lacks analytical language. 
When rage becomes too big, too burdensome, violence functions to relieve it. The subject is trapped in itself and the expelled bullets alleviate the toxic energies that put pressure on the body for release. Fiction, fiction also acts on these moments of intensity. Think, for example, of, of Vega Yunge's publishing record, 2003, Bill Bailey, 2004, Lamentable Journey, 2005, Blood Fugues, right? This kind of extraordinary moment of intensity of publication. And they're not short novels. They're, these, they're, they're novels that have a kind of epic um, ambition. And all come the years following 9-11. He was haunted by 9-11, always talked about 9-11, uh, and, and saw literature as a kind of response, and maybe in some ways the only response to 9-11. He often told me of his need to write after 9-11, to counter the narrative of violence, the need to destroy in order to rectify with the possibilities inherent in fiction. For in fiction, we also get a release but not an, an annihilating of the other, but by preserving him or her, we preserve ourselves. The imagination, as Vega Junque saw it, expanded us, brought us beyond ourselves, and forced us to critically engage our world as he put it. Or as he put it, I hope my fiction wakes people up. In, Lament in, in Lamentable Journey, Vega Junque describes Maruquita, the most important character of the book, I think. Again, I'm not sure he thought this. <laughs> and we often went back and forth on, um, on characters and on his texts and so on. Um, as having an over, he describes her as having an overactive sense of justice. Because in her capacity to tell stories, to control and refigure representation, she's able to morph reality in her favor. The young witch describes her epiphanic moment to her mother, quote, I figured it out, mom. It's quite simple. It's like this. I can change into a monkey or a squirrel or even a peacock of imposing presence and beauty, a presence that represents power and aesthetic pleasure. If I can change into such representations, I can change into anything. Well, I've managed to change into a graduate of the Naval Academy, Annapolis in political science. I also have an MA in economics and a PhD in comparative lit literature from Harvard, close quote. The transformative propensity of fiction opens routes linking the magic of a witch to a Harvard degree. That is to say, an overactive imagination makes everything a possibility. In this sense, the practice of reading, writing, allows for the practice of freedom Vega, Yuge, Vega Yunque ends Lamentable Journey by turning Omaha Bigelow into a monkey. Caught with, within the confines of the jungle, Omaha Bigelow misses, what does he miss? Poetry. The novel ends, quote, he was just a poor monkey mired in the complexity of a world that has lost its poetry. Perhaps he thought in his muddled monkey mind we are all too poor, we are all poor, confused monkeys, and all of us are lost in a world devoid of poetry. The Latino future, Vega Junque uh, strongly suggests, will depend on how seriously we take our songs, our poetry, and our fiction. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Very I, little? I oh. got mic as well. Maybe the mic. I yeah. thought it, you wanted to yeah, I thought it, I actually felt it kind of. I'm going to turn it on and off again. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me now? No. No? I'm going to have to pick up this one. Oh, this one works. Well, that one works. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Should we just move around? Yeah. Let's switch it on. That one works, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I have to be leaning like this. So. Do you hear me? Yeah. 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 Ye
you hear me now? Yes? Uh, good evening now. Okay. Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, I'm extremely glad that um, Mario Ramirez and, and the center invited me uh, to be part of this presentation uh, in honor of our dear friend, uh, Edgardo Vega Junque. Uh, I knew Edgardo personally for, for many years. Uh, we go back basically to the mid 80s uh, when along with people like Clemente Soto Vélez, you know, we got together a number of times in Clemente Soto Vélez house, in fact, and in other, you know, uh, venues, you know, basically places where there were literary events, presentations, and that's where I first met uh, Edgardo. And since I first met him, I don't recall exactly the, the first place where I met him, you know, but I know it was a literary event of some sort. Um, we became good friends, and uh, we stayed friends throughout uh, all those years, believe it or not, uh, because Ed was, you know, a, a bit of a difficult character to to deal with, and he had very strong opinions about, well, uh, practically everything. So obviously, you know, you had to somehow duel with him, and he had to, to a certain degree, respect your dueling uh, with him, otherwise, you know, you were going to be destroyed. <laughs> uh, so uh, I enjoyed many, many, many conversations with him, including the last one uh, I had with him, a very long conversation, which happened, and that was the last time I saw him. Um, uh, it was after a, a reading and a book presentation of uh, Roberto Marquez, a uh, very important anthology, Puerto Rican poetry, which uh, Roberto Marquez, along with other translators, um, uh, did the uh, translations. And we were invited to read, a number of us, including Julio Marsan, who's not here with us. And afterwards, since Julio and I were very close friends of, of, of Ed, we went out to uh, Second Avenue, and uh, he liked uh, Japanese food, so we, you know, we went to a Japanese restaurant, and it was late at night, and we stayed until they actually kicked us out of there. Uh, and we were boisterous at times, you know, discussing literature, food, diets, all sorts of things. Um, and we drank, as you can imagine, a, lo a lot of nice sake uh, that day. And I remember that fondly because it was uh, the last time uh, I saw him, and I had a chance to to spar with him, you know, to, to have uh, exchanges with him, along with, obviously, with, with Julio Marsan. Um, out of all that, you know, I, I decided that um, I was going to talk basically uh, in a general way, you know, reflect upon uh, a part of his work, not all of his work. Um, uh, Richard has done a great job with The Lamentable Journey, which I think it's uh, along with, no matter how much you promise to cook or pay the rent, uh, I think for me those are the, are the two, you know, the two really heavy, heavy novels. Uh, you know, I want to talk about, you know, in general, beginning with the comeback and, you know, things of that nature. Um, I have something written, so I'll, I'll read, but at the same time I'll, you know, interject. Uh, I first met Edgardo Vega Junque during the mid-80s. I don't recall the place or the event where we first met, but as usual with us writers, it had to be a literary event. What I have no doubt about is our sustained friendship through the years. During that time, we had a significant number of conversations dealing with literary matters, and I will list just a few. The role and place of the Puerto Rican Latino writer in American society. The Puerto Rican literary canon and its neglect and or disregard for the diasporic side of the equation, which was always in his mind too, by the way. And he always tried, by the way, he always tried bridging that gap. Uh, it, it was a writer that you know, really made a conscious attempt to be close to Puerto Rican writers in Spanish, among them Mayra Santos Febres, whom obviously Tom knows very well, uh, Ana Lidia Vega and others. Uh, the result of that encounter or that bridging wasn't as successful as he wanted it to. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's a long story and that's another uh, panel discussion that we should <laughs> engage in sometime. Yeah. 
Um, also, the struggle between the island's colonial dilemma and the decolonization process formulated in the works of authors like himself. So that decolonization process is very important in a number of characters in his fiction. Uh, I'll name one immediately that I always uh, select in, in, in my classes of Latino literature, and that has to do with a casualty report, the short story, mm -hmm. in which Sonny Maldonado has this epiphany after coming back from the Vietnam War and realizes that the enemy is here, is not over there, mm -hmm. and even though he's basically a functional illiterate, he begins to realize that he has been lied to. And this again throws into gear another, you know, it links themes one to another. And the link in here is the whole idea of deceit, of being lied to, which is carried in his work from the very beginning, including with, you know, uh, characters that are children. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, for example, I'm thinking of um, Gabrielito in, in Horns, you know, in which, you know, he's asking the grandfather about, you know, about you know the thing that had happened to this lady that was killed, and he gets punished in the process. But then he realizes that you know everyone in the family basically is lying to him, and you know he he doesn't feel good about this. And I think that's a constant that works. That you know that somehow the writer Ed Vega, but also the characters that he creates, were always struggling with this idea. You know that that flashback to childhood is quite, I think it's essential to understanding his work and to understanding the characters as adults. And you know, you see that even from the very beginning, even in the comeback, you know, you see this and, and you see, for example, in the comeback, something very interesting for you that probably have not read that novel, and I think it's an important novel to read uh, because um, first it's from 1985, it's the first thing he actually published uh, as, as in book form. And um, that, that particular novel gives you the story of a Frank Garboyle, I believe, right? Frank Garboyle, also known as Armando Martinez. So, you know, one day he's Frank Garboyle, another day he's Armando Martinez, you know, so what's the deal here? Well, obviously it's like a sort of like a split personality or, you know, a person that can change uh, personalities because obviously the whole notion of identity is in question. And this becomes a very important theme throughout his work. You know, the whole notion of identity, how do you deal with it? Uh, at the very end of um, uh, No Matter How Much You Promise to Cook or Pay the Rent, you know, it's very beautiful, you know, in, Santurce, in the Santurce section, all the, all the way at the end, when Vidamia is reflecting upon the fact that she no longer has to uh, struggle with the, the whole idea of identity because she has become everyone somehow. You know, she doesn't have to be black or Puerto Rican or Irish or anything. You know, she's everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, perhaps it's an idealization, but I think it's a very important metaphor for what Ed Vega was trying to accomplish as a writer in the American scene, you know? So I think that's something that it needs to be considered, you know, for, for people that in the future will continue reading his work and studying his work. Um, he also liked to talk a great deal, I'm, I'm sure he has done that with, with Richard, uh, about the relative strength and weaknesses of Latino and Latina writers, mm -hmm. and th this comparative element, you know, this sparring, you know, with, with, with writers. Um, he also obviously would always go off on the dictators of literary taste. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and of course, he would talk a great deal about the freedom and improvisation of jazz music and its relationship to the art of the novel. And I think that's also key mm -hmm. to understanding, you know, the whole idea that you can structure something very well, you know, like an orchestration, but at the same time, you have that liberty to all of a sudden improvise, all of a sudden go in a, in a narrative solo. Digress. Uh, digress, you know, which is, uh, you know, one of his major uh, techniques. You know, he always he was always doing that. Um, so the list of topics obviously could go on and on, and others who talked about it. Um, another thing that I, that I wanted to stress is that uh, Edgardo always thought to express in his fiction the complexities, tribulations, contradictions, ideals, and challenges of fictionalizing the American experience 
through the particularly enigmatic lens of the Puerto Rican and Irish di di diasporas. Uh, and I think we go again back to the comeback because from the very beginning, that's there, it's a constant. And it, um, I'm sure people will study this because I think it's, it's quite important and quite relevant you know, to him. Um, uh, he always wanted to represent, you know, since the comeback, um, things most people were afraid to talk about or reveal about themselves. <laughs> You know, so that's also there. Thematically, the novel brings to light, and I'm talking about the comeback here, important characteristics that will accompany Vega Junque throughout his writing career. In this case, the search for identity, as I already mentioned, with Armando Martinez, Frank Garboyle. And um, also something that you notice in that novel that I've noticed uh, in another novel that I read before, uh, his novel, and it's a novel that I consider a, a Puerto Rican classic, whether or not you know people have really abandoned this novel and have actually neglected it in Puerto Rico, uh, I think it's a it's a major novel, a major achievement, and I'm talking about Embabia by Jose E. De Diego Padro. Okay, De Diego Padro, who was also a poet, an accomplished poet, also an essayist and a journalist. But I think this is his major work, Mbavia, precisely because it's the story of a Jerónimo Ruiz who, like a lot of the characters in Ed Vega's fiction, have to struggle with their conscience, have to, you know, they, they have to somehow, they're struggling to understand who they are and where they are. And, you know, it's, it's a very difficult process. And, um, and in all cases, it's, it's, the, it's the idea of the brachycephalus. That individual with the big head, the big brain, that somehow has to figure this out, but somehow can't, and feels himself very, you know, thrown into a lot of uh, elements that have to do with loneliness and solitude, which is a theme that runs through his work uh, a great deal. Um, but I notice also uh, uh, stylistically, structurally, and even though I had many conversations with him, I never actually got to the point to actually ask him if he had actually read Mbavia. Perhaps he did. Uh, it's not far-fetched. Um, I might be one of the few people around here that maybe have read Mbavia completely. It's a, it's a huge novel, just at, in the same way, the same tonality, to a certain degree, as Ed Vega. And what, this, and what the novel has that, as you see in the comeback, is this whole idea of actually giving you a preview of the chapter's plot by giving you like a little summary, you know? And you see that in the comeback, and you see definitely that in, in Bavia throughout, you know? And it's the story of this individual that, it, you know, is trying to somehow understand that, you know, what New York is and what, how does he fit into that or does not fit in, you know? And the novel doesn't give you any easy answers, and it has a lot of digressions, it has a lot of you know, philosophical insights and all sorts of things, which we later find in Annette Vega, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it, it's a, it, will, it will be an interesting thing to try to look at that mm -hmm. as, a, as a possibility for study, for further study. Um, and I also put it here that Vega Junque was always interested in examining the decisive moments and critical junctures of his characters' lives. From this viewpoint, memory plays a crucial role in recreating that sudden density of life. I think you talked about that too, because I think that is very important. And I think that's one of the key qualities of a novel, you know, to be able to bring that out. That overcomes or overwhelms his central characters, uh, each one battling with his or her conscience, dealing with contradictions piled upon contradictions in their inner selves. And of course, you know, I leave that, that thought in there, like in midair, li deliberately, so that you could think of characters that I'm gonna mention now, which are mainly from his, uh, from his first three books. Uh, here's a list of some of those memorable characters. Of course, Armando Martinez, Marixa Soto, who's in the same comeback movie, and I think just a very strong character. Uh, Mendoza, of course, of the Mendoza's dreams. Fructifera Soto. Uh, Filiberto Casablancas, Mercury Gomez, that's a great character, Chucho Barbosa, Gabrielito, Amalia Santiago, Sonny Maldonado, 
Dan and Ray Cartagena, very interesting uh, characters, and uh, the characterization processes is quite interesting because it also treats the theme of uh, suicide, you know, and what leads to that. You know, what, it, what happens that there's no way out for this genius who knows 12 languages fluently and, you know, can do almost anything, you know? Um, and of course, um, Lou Torres um, from the Ebony Tower or Vida Mia Faro, you know, uh, which is a, he's a great, great character, along with a whole cast of characters in that novel that, uh, that I, I dearly love, including Bir Billy Farrell. Uh, and of course, uh, Elsa Santiago, right? Elsa, mm -hmm. the PhD in psychology. And that brings another, you know, that brings up another thing about, you know, the whole idea of intellectuality in his novels and the whole idea of the intellect, which is interesting, you know? Um, whether it was a short story or a novel, in Vega Junque's fictional world, the reader encounters the transformation and interweaving of themes to create elaborate counterpoints. And I think this is interesting because, you know, there's always like a sort of like, like something that is waiting against a, another, you know? Uh, there are always characters in waiting, and at the same time, there's a big tension. You know, they're ready like to explode. They're ready to somehow, you know, come out, you know, out of something. Um, this type of thematic linkage, in a way, proposes a dialectical search for truth. And I put here in parentheses because uh, we know we both knew him, and we dearly loved this this man, in the manner used by the great Puerto Rican poet and patriot Clemente Soto Vélez, whom he dearly admired. And I think you mentioned that too. And I think that that's another point of contact, you know, that dialectical element, you know, in which you know you got to try to find between you know synthesis and you know uh, the issues and things that he incorporated into his stories and novels are too significant, complex, and painful to be ignored. Structurally, he strove not for completion, but for expansion and opening out. The purpose of the novel and of the short stories was to liberate, as in the symphony, the notes, which I consider here characters, and tunes, which I consider here actions, composing it. Here's a list of themes among many, but these are some of the major things in his work. For example, the search for identity, that's obvious. Assimilation versus transculturation, racial politics, the political condition of Puerto Rico and its people, the Vietnam War, solitude, death, success, and its ramifications, subalternity, love, and the whole question of love is really, you know, another topic that you know would, it would, was, you know, we could be here, you know, the whole night. Um, uh, loss of innocence as a major theme, search for truth and knowledge. Invention versus authenticity, you know, people that reinvent or invent themselves, and you know the whole notion of authenticity, which for Ed Vega was uh, uh, was very important. This whole notion of authenticity in art, and of course, you know, there are a number of narrative techniques, you know, that he uses, including digressions, epiphanies, uh, multiplicity of characters, flashbacks, foreshadowing, magic realism, multiple references you know, political, cultural, social, you name it. Uh, he has, uh, of course, the use of magic realism in certain, you know, in certain, act, you know, specific works. Um, the use of humor, a lot of humor, uh, sarcasm, irony, parody, carnavalesque elements in which you distort and exaggerate everything. Uh, symbolism, intertextuality, bringing in text from other, you know, texts. Uh, stories within stories. And of course, I end by saying, and much, much more. Thank you. My husband, Dan Evans, couldn't be here uh, this evening. He's uh, quite ill tonight. Um, so I want to tell you a little background about me. I'm the daughter of uh, two Italian-American radi Italian radical community activists of East Harlem, Rose and Pete Pascali. And uh, I have memories of Marc Antonio and Dr. Cavello, which I know Ed was influenced by. Um, 
I, I met Ed and Pat, who was pregnant at the time with uh, their young son, Timmy, in 1964, and that's the same year I met Dan Evans. Dan was passing through New York on his way to Europe when he stopped in East Harlem at Barrio, met me, and he never left East Harlem at Barrio. Dan and, ha Dan and Ed had a wonderful friendship, two writers talking about their craft. I remember a story Dan once told me about when he first met Eddie. They started talking about writing, writers, and Eddie said he was cleaning out a basement. Is this good? And he found a box full of books, and he started reading them all. And one of them, Wild Palms by William Faulkner, stunned him with its beautiful writing. And he told Dan that was when he made a vow to be a writer. We all know how cantankerous Ed could be, and I can honestly say, and I'm always going to get emotional about Ed, I'm sorry, thinking of him being cantankerous is Ed, but Dan and Ed never had an argument in the 43 years of their friendship, and I think Dan was one of the few people who was able to say to Ed, hey Eddie, let it go. You keep your reality and let them keep theirs. And uh, Dan and Ed shared a love of sports, puns, the Three Stooges, but most of all, a love of writing. And theirs was a beautiful friendship. And I'm going to read you what Dan planned to read tonight. So these are the words of Dan Evans. Ed Vega, Edgardo Vega Junque, yo soy Puerto Riqueño. Many, many years ago, Eddie came to me and said, I'm finally getting one of my stories published. It's coming out of, and is it Nuestro? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Nuestro. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nuestro. Okay. Magazine, because I have the A of the O and I couldn't remember. I, and Dan said, that's great news, Eddie. Congratulations. And Eddie said, yeah, it's great news, but at the same time, it's created a dilemma. And Dan said, oh, what is that? And Eddie said, I don't know whether I should sign it by Ed Vega or by Edgardo Vega Yonke. And Dan said, you've come to the wrong guy, Eddie. I'm a minimalist. <laughs> it, it was a poignant tale of a young mother in El Barrio who had just enough money to play the number that she played every day or buy a can of dog food to feed her kids for dinner. Mother love went out. She cooked the dog food using a lot of spices, and the kids loved it. That same day, the number she always played came out. In those days, the number was determined by the last figures of the paramutual take at the racetrack. Hence the story's title, with a nod to William Faulkner, Wild Horses. Wild Horses by Ed Vega. A second story was published also in Nuestro Magazine. The hero was beset by many obstacles and problems, but his biggest inner struggle was that of his identity. Should he call himself William or Guillermo? In the end, Guillermo wins out. I only saw this, saw this story once when Ed showed me the magazine, and I can't recall the title. Nevertheless, it was written by Ed Vega. Then came his first novel, a wild and wonderful story of a Puerto Rican Eskimo hockey player. Zany characters, helter-skelter action, unrelenting satire. Here was the first sound of Eddie's voice to truly be heard in American literature. It was called The Comeback by... Ed Vega. The comeback was followed by a wonderful collection of short stories, Mendoza's Dreams. Once again, the bursts of imagination that highlighted the comeback, but this time pervaded by a gentle humor, a tender hearted stance, and a warm flowing poetry of words, Mendoza's Dreams by Ed Vega. Another collection of short stories followed. These were powerful, bitter works and the satire so sharp that when you turned the pages, you felt your fingers were touching razor blades. Casualty Report by Ed Vega. Then finally comes the monumental work, Bill Bailey. I'm going to risk Eddie's wrath and not recite the whole title. We'll be here all night. <laughs> Bill Bailey launches Eddie into the forefront of new world-class writers, humorous, tragic, lyrical, horrifying, written in a unique, perfected prose style, embodying American jazz with the structural precision of a Brandenburg concerto. Here, Eddie had reached the summit, 
not the peak. The peak he set for himself was inaccessible, but he had reached a summit, a place where he could drive in a state that said, I got this far. Thus, we have Bill Bailey by, for the first time, Eduardo Vega Yunque. I would like now to go back to two earlier novels that never saw the light of day. The first was Eddie's very first novel, written in the genre of an author's fictionalized reminiscences of his childhood. In this case, the fictional town of Casimar, Puerto Rico. We all love this manuscript, a boyhood so lovingly portrayed, and the prose beautiful in its simplicity. But Eddie refused to publish it, or even submit it for publication. It was a derivative work. It was not yet his voice. The second novel came years later. The title was Dread, D-H-R-E-D. -E it dealt with America at the time of the Vietnam War, portraying the painful struggle of the men in combat in a war they didn't understand, and the no less painful struggle of the men who were not called upon to fight, and the guilt they felt when their comrades went down. The hero of this novel was not the narrator, nor a, violent, a valiant soldier on the front lines, nor an equally valiant protester at home. The hero of this novel was the narrator's prick, his dick, his Johnson. <laughs> Never has there been such a harrowing portrayal of the terror of a man's inability to control his inner self. Dread was never published. I'm not sure Eddie ever submitted it. I can just see the publisher sitting at his desk with the manuscript in his hands. Do you really expect us to publish a book like this, Mr. Vega? Why don't you write something more in line with Perry Thomas, a junkie novel like Down These Mean Streets? That would be a sure bestseller. I'm sure that many of you are not unaware of Ed's cantankerous nature that adds a slapstick finale to the scene described above. But I want to say this and make it very clear. Ed's cantankerous nature was more than matched by his integrity as a writer. Nothing could have persuaded him or forced him to write a novel of El Barrio drug dealers and junkies, poverty, obscurity, scorn. They could have put him in front of a firing squad and he would have stared unflinchingly down the barrels of the rifles, refusing the blindfold and the cigarette. Well, at one point in his life, he might have accepted the cigarette. The last novel I read of Eddie's was Omaha Bigelow. Again, I'm going to risk his wrath and skip the whole title because I want to focus on the hero's name. Omaha Bigelow, Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska. Middle of America travels on a magical journey through the Low East Side to its ever awaiting destination, Casamar, Puerto Rico. Here is a novel so rich in imagination, satire, humor, and poetry that it cannot be denied its standing as a masterpiece. After I read it, I called Eddie and said, I just finished reading Omaha Bigelow. I think it's your greatest book. He got mad. <laughs> <laughs> then he started talking about his new work and I couldn't get a word in edgewise. He sent me part of the new manuscript. That was the last I heard from him. I've mentioned so far Ed's cantankerous nature and his integrity. He had one other inequality that far surpassed these, and that was his love for mankind. It was this love that drove him and sustained him, and even though as time went on, he succeeded in concealing this love more and more, all along it blessed him and those of us knowing him. Eddie once made me an unimaginable gift. I still feel shaken and you humbled by the magnitude of this gesture. He dedicated his book, Mendoza's Dreams, to me. I knew it was part because we were comrades, brothers, both of us struggling in poverty and obscurity and vowing not to quit. And our families were close too, Eddie and Pat and their four kids, and Lulu and I with our three young sons. We all loved each other. Once, um, when Lulu and I came back from Europe with the boys, we couldn't find an apartment. Eddie and Pat opened their home to us. I remember building a three-tier bunk in their spare room across from our bed. But at the last minute, we found a place and didn't have to encroach on their lives. 
Nevertheless, the image of their open arms and the flowing warmth of their hearts enveloping us as part of their family is a cherished memory that still lives on with me and always will. I also believe that Eddie dedicated the book to me because as writers, we both had the very same ultimate goal, in Eddie's words, to do with the typewriter what we abhor to do with the sword. To do with the typewriter what we abhor to do with the sword. And that brings me to the last lines of Eddie's first novel, The Comeback. A desperation has set in amongst the story's main characters, one of whom is a writer named Vega. A desperation not to give up their all, but hopeless struggle, but to carry on the revolution to free Puerto Rico from American rule. This unyielding course of action having been decided upon, Vega retires to his room to once more take up his writing in advance the cause. The last line of the book goes something like this, and down the hall you can hear the sound of his typewriter, tap, tap, tapping. Yes, throughout eternity we will hear the sound of that typewriter, tap, tap, tapping. Thanks, Eddie. And thanks to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies for this opportunity to speak these words. No, I don't mind. Uh, it's everyone's given me a lot of um, jumping off points because I have I I didn't I had there are too many things that I could say. Um, I I also want to thank. Centro and uh, all of the work they've done and and um, for accepting um, you know the tremendous collection of um, I, I don't know his his life's work and his his papers and uh, it was overwhelming um, you know the way he died and the the circumstances that um, he died under, it left this mystery I felt I had to solve. And uh, I had a, a, a journey into the impenetrable jungle of um, Brooklyn, <laughs> Sunset Park. It was like a, a treasure map. I thought I was going to figure everything out if I could just you know, follow the clues, there would be uh, some insight into what it all meant. Um, because as a child, uh, you know, I've gone through various stages of understanding what um, my childhood meant and my identity and, or lack thereof uh, growing up with such a, you know, a huge personality. I mean, cantankerous is a word that Tom Colty used as um, in reference to uh, something about the way he was edited or the lack thereof. He could be a cantankerous, um, but now it's become a euphemism for the incredibly mean nasty things that could come out of his mouth there was it was a true vitriol he could hurt with his words it was like poison it was he was not cantankerous he was not cranky he was a very very angry man he was furious at the world and he did not want to pick up the sword he chose instead to pick up the pen but you know, there were times when he could not resist, and the words failed him, and he chose violence. He was violent, and uh, it comes through in in his writing. And I don't, I don't know. Um, anyway, I I want to read what I wrote. I may digress, as embarrassing as that would be for me to do, because I hated jazz. I hated it. I hated <laughs> jazz growing up. I just thought, what the f? These people are just, it's like masturbating in public. You know, why, you don't, why, you know, stick to the script. Don't just, oh, look at me, I'm going off all crazy, and it doesn't it sound great, yeah. 
<laughs> now it's your turn. We'll watch you masturbate. I, I, there was something so offensive about it to me. I don't know. Um, anyway, <clears throat> a close friend of mine recently told me a story about the first time she ever met my father after, sc after school one day. <laughs> and through dinner, she could not believe how much we laughed. Another time, we were riding the subway up to Riverdale to watch my brother Matt play ice hockey. And an argument ensued. Don't bother arguing with Allison. She's a, she always wins, my father remarked. <laughs> Joanna, my lifelong friend, has told me this story before, and I used to feel proud that this was how my father thought of me. But recently, and finally, I heard what she really meant. I felt bad for you, she said. What a burden to carry, believing that you must always be right. But it was coming up with the right words at the right time that saved me at the dinner table. For if you chose the wrong words, words were very, very important growing up Vega. Careful selection around the dinner table. The right choice and admiration ensued. The wrong and a full-fledged assault began. I remember the time I mentioned that bowling and boxing were my favorite sports and my father swept in. Do you want to be punched in the face? Do you want to hang out with fat middle-aged men? <laughs> I was eight years old and I really did not know what the sports entailed. I had just seen a list of sports and they looked appealing. They, they were arranged alphabetically, B-O-W-L-I-N-D, B-O-X-I-N-D. But it was typical of the sort of over-the-top reaction that my father had to you know, m meaningless child talk. Um, it was strictly verboten in my house. Um, we were not allowed to speak Spanish, and I was embarrassed to be. I wanted to say I am Puerto Rican. I, I am not white. When the kids in the school in our neighborhood teased us, you know, white girl, white boy. You couldn't really curse back or say, I'm not, I'm Puerto Rican in my educated little tiny white voice because it just didn't fly, you know. I, one day, uh, 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 one of the girls in my sixth grade class, my dad picked me up from school and she said the next day, why didn't you tell us your father was black? And I said, because I didn't know. Because <laughs> I definitely would have told you. If I'd thought of that, that would have been cool. <laughs> um, anyway, my father did not want to be confused with being black either, though. He, I think this struggle over identity um, came from labels, you know. He didn't, he... He had an offer to have Bill Bailey published years earlier and then, yeah, no, turned it down, reneged because he, he didn't like it. the label of people of color. He didn't want to be part of the melting pot. He wanted to be, you know, distinguished. And, and there was an air about my father that I could never understand because we were dirt poor. And I couldn't believe how proud he was, how the the airs that he put on. And I always felt like, who the fuck are we? I mean, why, where did this come from that he's so superior to everyone? <laughs> and um, I mean, it, his family is not so different, so probably it came from there, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's like, uh, I, I mean, it's not unlike, I don't know. I, anyway, I don't, I don't know. I, like I said, it was like a, a treasure hunt, the, the papers and who, who he was and how he, how he dared to do the things that he did and why he believed that he could. And I read his journals from uh, before he met my mother and he had this, he developed this rage sometime between the Air Force and college about wanting to be famous not wanting 
to pass a stranger on the street without them realizing who he was. He wrote, you know, I, I want to scream at them. Don't you know who I am? Um, and I, I have some of his letters and, and some of the places where he wrote. In fact, he did submit Dread. I have it oh, in yeah. his letter to, it was at, uh, he had uh, an agent in uh, 1981 who had submitted it to, I don't know how to pronounce, Knopf. Knopf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, obviously, he did not publish it. Um, but he says, um, let me see, where is the, uh, what did I say just before this? That, that I'm looking you know, for. that he was determined to be famous. Yes, his famous, ah, yes. Um, so he's coming to visit me at Harvard, and so he writes, um, he writes somewhere amongst the millions of papers, he writes, um, I think when people part with no regrets, with no issues unresolved, as we did, then the missing is not part of the picture. Oh sure, there are times when I wish you were around to talk with, but just thinking about you enjoying yourself in play and study, or just being ridiculous with your friends, fills me with great pride. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the end of October, although I'm somewhat apprehensive of coming to the school and meeting other people. I suppose if I had any regrets concerning you, it is that you cannot yet introduce me as your father and have people say, the Ed Vega? Mm -hmm. But that's shallow egoism, and if that was what I needed in my life to help me become enlightened, it would be there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but it, it, it was a running theme. It was really, I think all, all, encompassing was that he he wanted to write the great american novel he wanted to write uh and that's everything else he sacrificed everything for it he sacrificed love and companionship and he was you know just driven i know from his correspondence at the end of his life that he just was on a mission and he was alone and um Mm -hmm. He pushed people away. Um, our last exchange was an email, and um, I'm going to read some of it. And um, I, I always felt when I saw the movie Big Fish mm -hmm. that I could relate to the character because I felt like my father was not a writer. He was a liar. You know, he lied to us, and I didn't even, I, and I believed him. I was so, and I still, I am so, my heart fills with pride when I hear, you know, the, the, the esteem with which you all speak of his writing. I, I, I feel that theme. I'm a little girl again, and you mark my words he'd say you mark my words this time next year i am going to have a novel published and it's going to be huge and we'll be living in the biggest apartment on park avenue and i believed him and we didn't we didn't move we were evicted after you know not paying the rent year after year you know it's how uh we became we uh the two of us my father and i became actors uh, at the Orpheum Theater in um, El Piraguero de Luis Aida was my father arguing in a housing court right. that we not yes. be evicted. He met uh, Bimbo Rivas and um, <laughs> got cast as the lead and I understudied <laughs> for the part the director's daughter had and uh, we, we, it was great. I mean, we I spent a lot of time with my dad. I had a very different relationship with my father than my my siblings and um but um our last exchange he wrote to Sachi uh my daughter who was at college and he wrote and said Sachi this is a one time favor i promise never to bother you again <laughs> when you were a year old, I was visiting you and your parents. I was smoking at the time. 
You were coughing violently, and I had the realization that if I continued smoking, I would never see you graduate from college. What a guilt trip. <laughs> I, to put that on me, now, his dying wish to see his daughter graduate, his granddaughter graduate from college. Um, it is now going to be 21 years, and I've never even touched a cigarette again. Given the condition of our family and the problems I've caused all of us, it, I would nevertheless ask you how I can attend your graduation. No need acknowledge my presence. Please consider it. Thank you very much. Love, Grandpa. You know, he contacted her through her, her writing on the Crimson. He managed to, you know, get her email address. And I had tried around the time that my brother Tim died, um, which is nothing like the story my father describes in the dedication to Tim in uh, the Bigelow, Omaha, Omaha Bigelow. Bigelow. No. Um, he did not lose any friends. Tim did not lose any friends on 9-11. He was traumatized because his working crew had experienced being under a tent, which from the 101st floor must have looked like a rescue net, and so his crew hid under the tent and people jumped on them. I mean, they jumped on the stage and uh, Tim wasn't at work and he felt tremendously guilty because he was hungover. And, um, he couldn't recon reconcile whether his drinking saved his life mm -hmm. or um, had prevented him from saving someone else's life. Mm -hmm. And he was dead five months later. So, so I wrote back. I, Sachi forwarded me the message. She didn't write back, and I wrote back. I said, Dad, Sachi has a total of four tickets to the graduation. Brian and I are going, her whole family is coming from Japan, and only her dad and stepmom will be able to attend the ceremony. It will not be possible for you to attend. Sachi is not aware of the lasting damage you have inflicted on this family. Maybe she has an idea based on some of the stories we have told her and by the emotional deficiencies she can sense in me. I would prefer if you do not try and reinvent yourself for her. I tried to have some semblance of a relationship with you, and the reason I stopped is because I do not see any value. You seem to have little interest in my life. It felt that way because 90% of the discussions were about you. I was sickened at dinner when we went to Carne, and Sachi, who was 16, was talking about her Spanish teacher, who you knew, and how he had affairs with his students, and you, in reply, in a mildly provocative way, said, so, I had affairs with my students. I read ba Bill Bailey way back when it came out, and I liked it a lot. I wrote you a letter about what I liked, but I did not post it. I will get around to it. Please do not write to us. And my father wrote me a long, <coughs> I read back 